this morning. How many of us here in this room, you are perfect? Let me see your hands because we want to praise you if you are perfect. Uh, no hands. Okay, so we are not perfect. So that's good because this morning we're going to look at someone in the Bible that was very imperfect. And yet God fulfilled his plan in his life. And we will find encouragement in that. We want to look at the troubling character in the Old Testament. We are going to talk about Jacob. Jacob, what a character. What a man full of contradiction. Jacob, one of the most colorful characters in the Bible. What a story and what a life. And we can learn from this imperfect man important lessons for our faith because we also are very imperfect just like him. So as we begin looking at the life of uh, Jacob, I don't know how far we will go because we have many, many scriptures to look at because he's got a, a long life. He lived 130 years and uh, his life uh, story uh, spanned over many, many chapters in the book of Genesis. So I don't know how well. So we will not have time to look at all the details of his life. But uh, this morning I choose and I was led to that a few weeks ago at the beginning of this year with my new reading plan when I was reading about Jacob, it came in my heart to, to look more carefully about especially the encounters. You know, Jacob had many encounters with God. He started very poorly, very bad, you know, and we will look at many texts like this. But God met him and God was so gracious and so faithful. So today, actually, there will be like a, some sorts of a, a sub, uh, sub team and thro throughout of this. And actually, it's kind of the main theme of all this. It's about the faithfulness of God. How God is gracious and how God is faithful. So, first of all about Jacob. We learned that Jacob was born out of prayer. His, his birth is a miracle. Do you know that? And, and if you realize carefully about your birth, you are also a miracle because you have come from the will of God. God created you. That means he loves you. It means he has, a, he has a plan for you. So Jacob was born as a result of prayer. We read in uh, slide number two that uh, his wife was, uh, Isaac's wife was uh, not able to give birth. And Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. Wow, already there's a miracle in double blessing, twins. But the two children struggled with each other in the womb, so she went to ask the Lord about it. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations, two nations will be rivals, and your older son will serve the younger son. Because you knew in the custom at uh, that time, the older son inherit the blessing. But here, God already prophesied before he was born. That this is, this is an amazing story when you think. This only that text could be a, a sermon that we could explore the will of God, the plan of God, how God sees us, and how, you know, like this, this kind of thing. Jacob's life began with the struggle. Um, even as a twin in his mother's womb, he already showed his character. Already, you can imagine, he sh was shoving for a position in the in his mother's womb. And when he was born, he, w he was born clutching the the heel of his of his brother. That's where his name came from. Jacob means that he was grasping the heel, a heel catcher, something. And then many translated it that he, because he was always want to, to t take the, for himself, that he was a supplanter, he wanted to be first, and that he was a, a deceiver. And we know a lot of things already. Uh, y y you've read the Bible before. So from the mother's womb, the twins were rivals. And Jacob, we know the story, deceived his brother, tricked his father, and to blessing him instead of his older, older brother. We, we read that in Genesis chapter 27. What was included in Isaac's blessing? Because Isaac blessed Jacob. What kind of blessing? You said that in this one here. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. That is an awesome uh, prophecy or a blessing, a prophetic blessing over his son. And he thought he was blessing the, the eldest but he was being tricked into blessing the youngest. That is how, how cunning uh, Jacob was. 
So you will be Lord over your brothers and the son of your mothers will bow down to you. And immediately after uh, this all trickery that was uh, originated by his mother, Actually, we often called uh, I, uh, Jacob the, the, the deceiver, but he learned it from somewhere, you know. He took it from his mother. You know, this family was a kind of a dysfunctional family. They were like a preferred child and two children, each parent of a preferred child. So it, the perfect environment for conflicts and tensions and hatred and jealousy and things like this. And Rebecca is cunning and going behind the, the there's no unity among them. And she, she's the one to suggest all of this crazy plan to, to Jacob, if you think about that. So immediately after this trickery, uh, Esau come back with, with the food for his father, with the games that he hunted. And then he was so angry when he found out that he missed the, the blessing. He says, no wonder his name is Jacob, for now he has cheated me twice. First he took my rights as a firstborn, and now he has stolen my blessing. Oh, Father, haven't you saved even one blessing for me? And he lost everything uh, out, out of that. As a result, Jacob was forced to flee because Esau promised that he would kill his brother when his parents would not be. So on this way to uh, his uncle Laban's house and another part of the, another land very far away, God appeared to him. That is the first encounter. So you, so you see Jacob's character already, a cheater, a deceiver, and now he's going to meet with God. And it is an encouragement for us because God does not choose us because we are good, goody to shoes, because we are better than other. God sees something in, in, our, in our lives that nobody else will see. I don't know what God saw in Jacob that uh, brought him to appear to him and declare such a, a prophetic blessing over him. So that is the first encounter of many uh, that God appeared to Jacob. And the story of Jacob has many chapters, as I says, and because of time, we will focus mainly on these encounters, or some of them anyway. And uh, because, you know, if you look at the life of someone, uh, we, we saw the, the movie of Billy Graham this morning, who passed away to be with the Lord. If you think about your life, today you look at yourself, you're young. But uh, picture yourself like uh, 90 years old. My, my mom is 90 years old. Maybe your parents are a bit older or something. Picture yourself as, as 90 or 100 or whatever. There's still a few years uh, yet uh, to go for many of you, many, many years. So now you, you picture yourself, you see yourself right now. But what is God going to do or has to do yet in your life to prepare you for heaven? Do you think God has finished with you? Don't you think God has some tricks and his, and his sleeves to, to bring you to transformation, to sanctification, to, to fulfill his plan? To think about it, because here we, we, we think about it, the most important things in uh, J uh, J Jacob's uh, story is, are the uh, encounters with God. It's not Jacob's quick mind, his cunning his, his ability to deceive and, and bargain and do, you know, all sorts of uh, deals with people as we will see throughout his life, make decisions. Uh, Jacob always had a plan. For every problem, every crisis, Jacob had a plan. And also, like, he was, he was a, a, quick, a, a quick mind. He was a very quick mind. But what, what does interest you and me and Jacob's life? Is it his cunning mind? Or is it what God has done in his life? The same with you and with me. What is going to stay of our life? Is that how smart we are? The degree we earn? The jobs? How much money we would have made? The success in our business? What, what, what is it that we are going to leave behind that people will remind us? What is going to be the most important things at the end of our life? Isn't it what God will have done in our lives? And the way we will end our lives will be much more important than the way we started our lives. Do you agree with that? Yes? Okay. Only that side agree. This side a bit later. Okay. 
but this is not fair because on that side there are less, you are more, so that's why we hear more of your name. So it's the same for us, the, what will remain of us that is significant and worth mentioning, what will be worth mentioning of your life and my life will be what God will have done. And that's a reason why we need to sanctify ourselves and, and hold on to God's promise in our lives. As he's running away from his brother's anger, his first encounter with God we see. What did God promise Jacob? That's so amazing. Go to the next slide. I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather. Observe how God introduced himself, what kind of title he gives himself. I am the God of your grandfather and of your father. I'm not yet your God. But he is revealing, he's introducing himself to him. God knows how to do that. I will give you and your descendants the ground you are living on. So God gave Jacob the covenant promise that he promised his grandfather and his father before him. But not only that. That is already great. But you know, think of Jacob for a moment. He's alone. He's in the wilderness. He's traveling long distance because he puts himself in trouble because of his trickery and his cunning mind. You know, when you choose to do bad deals with people, it's going to come back to you. You, you cheat people, they will want to have a revenge against you. So Jacob, imagine, he's a young man. He is away from his mom and dad. He is alone, nobody to depend upon. Nobody to make him laugh. He's in a crisis. He's in a big emotional crisis, probably the biggest crisis ever. And he must be wondering, what have I done? I should not have listened to my mom. I don't know what's going on in his mind. Like we we're just like imagining things. But he is in a crisis. And look at the amazing God. God not only gave him the covenant promise to him as well, but he knows at the time that Jacob needs something more practical. He needs a promise that will uh, be more personal promise and a promise that is very needed at this time of crisis in his life. And I don't know if you know it and uh, in your life you will recognize it, but in my conversion, God did that uh, to me. At the right time, he came. Before I was, I, I said yes to Jesus, God came to me through different people at different events. I told my testimony before, but many times God came <coughs> knocking at the door of my heart. And many times I just refused him or ignored him or was ignorant that, he was, that it was him. I didn't know him and I did not res respond to him. But that night when I gave my heart to Jesus, I was in a crisis. My girlfriend, who is my wife now, was pregnant of a second child. I was going to abandon her. I was, you know, going to go for parties, choosing like a life of, you know, away from God instead of God. And that very same night, God spoke to me, called my name, and asked me. Uh, that is a, a very dramatic uh, experience that I had in my conversion. God asked me, Rene, are you satisfied with your life? I, I can identify with the moment uh, of this uh, encounter of Jacob at that time. When God is coming in this crisis and revealing himself to him and give him the most uh, awesome uh, promise that he needed to, to have at that time, just like he did at my time. And when I, uh, when I, I realized, when God was speaking to me that, I was not happy with my life. My life was such an a mess. God told me, I, and I remember, and I like to tell my story all the time because it, it edifies my faith. God says, I have let you choose your pathways. Have you found the happiness you thought of finding? No, Lord. Okay, if you are ready, come to me. I will lead you to a, a contentment, to a life of meaningful life. And at that night, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I was changed forever. And that's exactly what we read in that text here. Look at the, the, the next part, verse 15. What's more? I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. What an amazing, and the guy that is in the middle of a crisis that has no way to turn, nobody to cheat, he cannot do anything to change the situation. God graciously appeared to Jacob and gave him a totally undeserved grace and promise that he has. Pure grace. I am with you. I will give you. I will keep you. I will bring you. I will not leave you. 
Wow! How would you like to have this promise for next week? If you have a problem this week, you hear this for next week. Are you happy? Yes? Last night, I, I, somebody sent me a message, and, and, and I'm in a big crisis today. You, you, maybe you don't realize it because you don't know, but a, a shocking news I received last night. And these words must be for me today. I'm taking this promise just for me. <clears throat> what an amazing promise. Yet, notice how Jacob responds to God in the next slide. <clears throat> Jacob made this promise to God, or we see a vow or a promise, <coughs> a solemn promise. <coughs> if God <coughs> will indeed be with me, protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return, and if, and if, and if, he has just been given pure grace, the most amazing promise, and instead, of saying, thank you, Lord, here I am, take me. See, he starts with his if. His character, you can see his character coming back again, even with God. He's not even, you know, wow. He disregards God's grace, and he starts with if, and he goes into miserable bargain with God. If you do this for God, for me, if you do this, and if you fulfill this, like it's like he's becoming the boss. He's, he's stating his own, his own condition. Like if you do this, he's not receiving what God is giving to him. He's telling God what, what he wants to do. And then he's questioning God's promise. And he gives his own, <coughs> his own condition. Thank you. <laughs> and then he says, if you do this, and give me what I ask. Then I will worship right here on this mountain and I will pay my tithes to you. Wow, what a big promise. Have you ever made this big promise there? I remember a few years ago, a sister came to us and she gave a tithe of the lottery that she had earned. <laughs> so we didn't know that. We learned it a bit, a bit later. Lord, if you make me win at the lottery, I will support mission project. Lord, if you give me more money, then I will, I will be faithful with my tithe. You know, we make this kind of stupid vow to God, isn't that? It is so human of doing that. Yes. And I will serve you, God. You know, if you do this for me, I will serve you. Oh, I've seen so many people. I remember one time in Canada when I was pastoring over there, young man got um, his car broke down his radiator had a problem so he, he he did what you should never do is unscrew the lid of the radiator and he burned his face with boiling water and he was in the hospital and i went to see him and he was all disfigured and everything and oh you should have seen all the promises and the vows just like that he was going to serve god god is bringing him back and i've been so many times in hospital bed like listening to what people would do like regret or if i had known i would not have done this and now i'm ready to serve god and give them some time and then when this young man his face healed he just returned to what he was before you know look at 9 11 uh, in the u.s Churches were filling, uh, you know, the being filled all over the country. People were returning to God because, you know, of the judgment of God. And after life goes back, people go back as well. So we are very quick to be like Jacob with God and our relationship with God. God it's like we, we are trained to bargain. We're trained to make deal with, with God. And uh, it's not enough to just receive the goodness of God. We want to get something more out of God. Squeeze him a little bit more and get something more. So what he's telling God actually is like, I will build a church to you. That's what he says. And I will give my tithes to you. I'll give money to you. So as far as we know, Jacob did not really make all of his promise come true. Amen. <clears throat> Do you keep your promise to God? Question? You don't have to answer me. Just answer. Have you ever bargained with God? Hallelujah. So then we continue the story, and we will find an increasing tension um, between Jacob and the family where he is going. Like now he's, he's been going there, 
he will spend 20 years of his life. That's, that's, that's big. 20 years he's been cheated by his father-in-law. You know, the deceiver was deceived. It's often like that. You meet people that can, you know, uh, match uh, your, your cunning side. 20 years that he passed. And then during these 20 years, you will notice that there's no mention of altar, no mentions of prayers. After all this big promise, is just like him, dealing with his cunning uncle, being deceived by his uncle, deceiving his uncle, being deceived by his uncle, deceiving his uncle. And it goes like that for 20 years. It goes like this. And Laban, when, when he finished after 14 years working for his uncle, for his two wives, Jacob was ready to go back. And he asked, let me go back to my hometown. And Laban, his uncle, told him, please listen to me, Laban replied. I have, I have become wealthy, for the Lord has blessed me because of you. Oh, God is still being recognized by the um, idol worshiper uncle. Not even like a, a, pure, a pure worshiper of God. He's an idol worshiper, but he still recognized that God has done something good to his family through blessing Jacob, which is very good. And then they kept bargaining for salary, and finally um, uh, uh, Jacob remained there for six more years. During this period, we read nothing about praying and all of these. The situation grew worse. Later on, we find out <coughs> that Jacob soon learned that Laban's sons were grum grumbling about him. Jacob has robbed our father of everything, they said. He has gained all his wealth at our father's expense. And Jacob began to notice a change in Laban's attitude toward him. Whoa, tension was growing. Danger is coming. Maybe he will be attacked, he will be killed, or something bad will happen to him. Again, at the time of crisis, at the peak of the, the darkest moment, the most stressful time like this, God comes again. He will appear to him twice. Not one time, but two times uh, uh, nearby. The gracious and the faithfulness of God appear again. So that's what I'm saying. And that story, the hero of the story, is always God. It's always the grace, the grace of God and the faithful God in all this. And he come and he told Jacob to return. Go to the next slide, Genesis 31, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relative there, and I will be with you. Okay, so God appeared to him, it's time to return because things are going bad here, see? I've done my work, you've been here, now it's time to go back. Then um, he meets with his wife, verse 5, and he tells his plan that he, God spoke to him and he explained the difficulty, the tension, the negative atmosphere with his uncle. He's speaking with his two, two main wives. He said to them, I have noticed that your father's attitude toward me has changed, but the God of my father has been with me. Oh, after 20 years, you did not hear anything about God before, but now in trouble again, he recognized that God uh, is somewhere in his life. Observe the expression how Jacob called God. He, does he say, my God? He says, the God of my father, he has not yet fully uh, surrendered to God, does not know yet. He's not, not yet the God of Jacob. But there is a, a, a walk toward God. And Jacob told his plan to his two wives. And in a dream, God appeared to him again. Verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed. Remember, you made a vow to me. You remember your promise? You promise that you will build a, you know, a place of worship. You will pay your tithe. You remember that? Okay, now leave this land and return to your native land. It's time to serve me as you promised. Go back for me. Fulfill your vow to me. Then Jacob take all of his livestock, his family, his possessions, and without telling his father-in-law, runs away. His uncle, Laban, gathered all of his men and pursued them for seven days. And finally, they meet. And even in that moment when Laban could have really crushed him and destroyed him and brought him back, God, again, and his faithfulness, you, you need to see God in this story, how, how awesome he is. God has spoken to an idol worshiper uncle 
a, a crafty man, a, a liar and a deceitful man to don't say a word against Jacob. Don't do anything bad to him. Don't speak this or that to him. And then that's, that's why he, God protected him again. And then we pick the, up the story again. Then, after all of this, they made a covenant with one another. Laban returned home, and Jacob continued his way to his homeland. And then we find a big moment in Jacob's uh, story, J Genesis chapter 32. Jacob went on his way, and it says in the verse 1, I did not put it here, that the angels of God met him. This is, this is a little something, and the Bible does not make it a big story, but as he is going, the presence of God is going with him. The angels of God met him. Then Jacob found himself in trouble. He always had a plan. You remember that? Jacob is a tricky, tricky man. For example, when he heard that his uh, brother Esau was coming to meet him with 400 men, he came up with a plan. That's, that's his style. Okay, and you read it in verse se seven, or seven and eight. Or I, I, maybe, maybe I skipped that, that verse. Jacob was very afraid and upset. So he divided the people who were with him into camps, as well as the flocks, herds, and camels. If Esau attacks one camp, he thought, then the other camp will be able to escape. He's got a plan for everything. Esau has 400 men, so let's break the camp in two, send one ahead, keep the wives and the most precious here. So if he destroy everybody else, then maybe some of us can escape. He's got a plan, okay? Then after he makes his plan, he goes to God in prayer, and that is what we see here. Then Jacob prayed, but it's, it's amazing to realize that it, we, we are so much like that, isn't it? Make your plan first, pray after, okay? <laughs> Try first to, to get out of your trouble. O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, you said to me, return to your land, to your relative, and I will cause things to go well for you. I am not worthy of all the faithful love you have shown your servant. With only my walking stick I crossed the Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Well, he's evolving a lot in that story. Something has happened. He has deepened his understanding of God. Again, realize this is at the moment of a crisis. He's very afraid at this time. So now, being humble, he's going to God in prayer. I'm not worthy of all the faithful love you have shown. And I only had my walking stick when I left, and he met me in Bethel. And he gave me a dream, and now I have, you know, so many animals and so much possessions and everything. Note the beginning of his, char uh, of his uh, change of heart. <coughs> then he goes on, rescue me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, as well as the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely treat you kindly or make you prosper, depending on which Bible version you have. Do something good for you. Cause something good to come into your life. Bless you. Work into your favor. And will make your descendant like the sands of the seashore, too numerous to count. I will cause things to go well for you. You are the one. God, now Jacob, you know, at first, there's a difference here in that prayer compared to the first prayer that he did when he encountered God in Bethel. First time, his prayer was not really a prayer, it was more a bargain like a deal that he was doing with him. But here you see humility, and you see that he is ready. And now he remembers the promise of God, and not only he remembers, but he reminds God. God, he says, you are the one who said to me. You promised that to me. Now do what you promised that you would do to me. Do it. So Jacob is reminding God of his promise. But, as, but lo look at Jacob's character. As soon as he finished praying, he goes back to his plan. He always go back to, to his plan. And you see, the, the conflicts that we all have as human beings between planning and praying. We always have that. You know, every moment of panic that you have in your life, every bad news that you have in your life, every hard or dark moment that you have, what do you do? It's a conflict. Pray first or plan first. Or, 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 or everything together, like just Jacob has done. Jacob is a perfect example of how we do. Plan, pray, plan. Or pray, plan, pray. Or whatever it is that you do. When a person plans, you lean more on your own management. 
you manage your crisis, and you, m you use your own crisis, and you are not prepared to see God act with his miracle in your life. That's what we do when we plan. We keep ourselves from being under the open windows of grace. We, 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 we take it into our own hand. We, we plan first. When a person prays, instead he leans more on God to help. And when a person plans first and prays, then he is asking God, bless my plan, which is also something that we do also. I will do this, I will give that much money, I will, I will invest in all this, and Lord bless what I want to do, and things like that. But you know, God knows us, and God is not really bothered by us, because God works over time, and God sees what he's going to do, what is going to, to come on that. Before we condemn Jacob, let's examine our own hearts because we have a lot of things in common with, with Jacob. We see a big difference in the way that he pray. Later, when he was about to meet Esau, you know, instead of trusting God, he just prayed, rescue me, God, you are the one who said you will keep me, you will protect me. But instead of letting God do it, he's not ready to believe yet and let go. He organized, again with his plan, he, he prepares 500 animals. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of years. That's a lot of work. That's a big, big, big amount of money. He does, okay, I'll send 200 of this and 40 of this and 40 of this first. And then on the second one, I'll get 200 of this and then 40 of this and 30 of this and all this. <coughs> He's got it all figured out. And Jacob thought, we read in the Bible, I will first appease him by sending a gift ahead of me. Amazing. He just spoke and thought like this just after he prayed. He just prayed and he's thinking like that. This is, this is how he is. And the story tells us that his gift was totally unnecessary. He, he gave it for nothing. He planned for nothing. He, he's done all of his cunnings and his planning for nothing because amazing God, gracious God, had already through these years appeased the heart of his brother and instead of killing him coming with swords and uh, attacking him he embraced him and received him with smile and love and welcome him forget it brother i'm i'm fine god has also blessed me i'm rich i don't need your gift and, and everything Wow, sometimes the trouble that we put ourselves in, if we would just let God and trust God, wow, can you imagine that? What a lesson we are learning this morning. Learn. We have so much to learn about Jacob's relationship with God through the encounters and through the prayers. What, let me ask you this question, what would we learn about you from your prayers? Because now we are learning about Jacob's prayer. It's so good. God is so gracious. He gives us all of these Bible characters. And God is so honest with us. He let us see the, f the flaws and the weaknesses and these heroes of faith. Remember, Jacob is a hero of faith. He has fears, but he has faith. He started like this, but he ended up doing the will of God. What are you going to end up doing? Maybe you are here. Maybe you have fears. Maybe you have doubts. Maybe you have been planning. Maybe you have been tricking this one and that one. You've been making the wrong choices and you have been paying with consequences on the things. And you have many regrets in the past. But don't despair. That's the message of Jacob's life. Don't despair. God is faithful. God is gracious. God forgives. God loves you. God has a plan. God will make bad things become good into your life, a learning experience. Maybe you will, you will experience consequences of your sin or consequences of your bad choice because that's what happens usually. But God's grace will use it at the same time in a different way to make it a learning experience, a learning about God or, or a tool to... to propels you to, to go to God and, and prayer and cry out for his rescue and everything. We always have something to learn. Then the big, the big movement. In verse 23, Jacob sent across the stream 
he was left alone. That is in chapter 32. I think I have a mistake here. The 30, chapter 32. Then a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And we know the story very well. We have heard sermons about this. He wrestled with, with an angel. And the angel is the angel of the Lord. This is God. He wrestled with God because it, it, the Bible tells us that he wrestled with God. And then through this wrestling match that lasted the whole night on daybreak in the morning, Jacob is still standing. Jacob is still wrestling. And God touched his, his hip and then is dislocated his, his hip. Then he was, you know, uh, not walking normally anymore. And then he says, let me go. It's morning. I need to go. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? And Jacob answered, no long, uh, I'm Jacob. No longer will your name be Jacob, but Israel, because you have fought with God and men and have prevailed. And then he blessed him and left. And this is an amazing uh, turning point. This is at that time. That's something profound. You see, in the previous encounters of God and Jacob, God, it was pure grace. He didn't do anything, just promise, just spoke blessing, just gave an instruction. But here, it's not through speaking. Th there's, there's a physical and spiritual contest here. There's a rest. Re Something more profound needed to take place here. It was necessary here in that text here, before God could fulfill his promise. Rem imagine, God is going to use Jacob to become the father of the nation of Israel. The land is going to be promised to his descendants. The Messiah is going to be born out of his descendants. So that's, that's big. But in order to achieve it and go into that direction, a, a bigger change needs to happen because so far we have seen that he's been quite, you know, using always his own mind. So here, the, the picture of God touching his hip, and that is a picture of Jacob surrendering his will, his flesh, because that's a picture of flesh, uh, a flesh that is broken, a, a flesh that stopped uh, functioning. You, you, you yield that moment to God. He, that's the moment where, and again, Imagine the crisis. He is by himself. He has sent all of his family, all the livestock. He comes back on that side of the river. He is by himself during that night. And the angel uh, meets with him and then fights the whole night. So that's, that's a big, big crisis that he is going through. He's, he's fighting. He's, he's got all, everything, all of his past, all of his sins, all of his plan, all of his fears, all of everything, the decision that he needs to, to make for his future. Everything is going on. Is he going to yield to God or is he going to come out just like before? Or is he going to yield to God and, and let God work his plan and his will into his life? And that is the beautiful story that we live. He humbled, like Pastor Jennifer sp spoke about it very, very well that, that a few weeks ago, that this is the picture of uh, humbling yourself under the, the, hand, uh, the, the mighty hand of God. And that's what Jacob done. No longer will your name be Jacob, but Israel. The transformation through repentance and faith. This is the moment, the big, big moment. And then he named this place the face of God. But you know, after that, even though we become Christian, we don't become perfect immediately. Life doesn't, you know, we don't obey uh, perfectly to everything that is God's will. And even though God had told uh, Jacob, go back to Bethel, he does not go back to Bethel. He goes somewhere else. It's, it's not far. It's nearer, but it's still not Bethel. And you know where he went to Sichem? He, 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 he deals with the people of the land, with the Canaanites. And a lot of bad things happen. His, his daughter gets uh, uh, raped. His sons massacre an uh, old, old town of the, the man over there. And then he gets so fearful that all the, the people of all the surrounding cities will come and attack them. Another big crisis. And it seems in that story, th this is me interpreting, that it is because he did not obey God. God had told him before, and we read it, go to Bethel. And go to where you made your vow. Worship me there. And then go back to serving me. But instead, he goes there. He purchased a piece of land. And he wants to live among these nations. 
and all this. And this dark, one of the darkest time, and there's about another 10 years of life that is spent because the total time of, of, of the Jacobs is about 30 years of our thing. From the time of the, the first stories until now, it will be about 30, 30 years. So that's a lot of years. I'm coming to 27 years uh, in Hong Kong. And I think it's quite a long time. But this is, we're talking about 30 years of his life that he has been floating around, you know, because of his trickery uh, from the beginning. But God is again so good. God said to Jacob, from the time when he was so fearful that th these nations would come and attack, go at once. Now God is more specific. Now, at once, go at once to Bethel and live there. Make this altar to the God who appeared to you there, that you fled, and, and, and do, do everything. And then, so Jacob seems to be, have uh, obeyed to this one. Verse 2, he to told his household, and there's something very particular in that encounter. From this encounter is the first time that you see Jacob being concerned with spiritual matters. Before, it's about me, my material well-being, my protections, this, this kind of things, my family, my, my wages. It's the first time that he realized that if he is going to have a relationship with God, sanctification must come personal sanctification. His wives, did you realize that his wives were idol worshippers? His father-in-law was idol worshippers? You remember that? And he never questioned that. He never argued with them, you need to stop that, because he himself was not really, really purely converted. Maybe he was becoming a bit uh, aware of God, but not yet. So here is only the only time after this big, big moment with God and his wrestling and his yielding and surrender to God, that now purification, sanctification, getting rid of idols is being asked. Because tomorrow we're going to praise God. Tomorrow we're going to serve God as a family. We're going to set on other that. Then I will make an altar to God who responded to me in my time of distress and has been with me wherever I went. Now he recognized God. But he recognized God from a spiritual point of view as well. He sanctified himself. And the same is true for us. We want God to bless us, but there are some areas of our life, if we are not sanctifying ourselves, how can God really... God is gracious. At nowhere you have seen God reproaching, rebuking, and you know, saying something bad. It's only grace. Jacob has only received grace. And that's amazing to me because us, we are very judgmental. We would say, no, Jacob, that was not right. You should do this. Don't do that. But God does not. And he patiently, he waits for the transformation uh, to come over, over here. So you see here, sanctification and consecration for the first time. And if you go a little bit further in the same chapter, God appeared to Jacob again and blessed him. And for the first time, you see the mention of God speaking to him like El Shaddai, the God that has uh, the, the, all the care, the, the, pro the, pro the provider of, of you over there. And Jacob, in verse 14, set up a sacred stone pillar in the place where God spoke to him. So then, in closing, we move further at the time when Jacob is very old and now is being led to Egypt. And we should say that before he was led to Egypt, again, J Jacob had um, many moments of fear uh, in his life, like big fear, dread of something like that, dread of change and everything. He was a very, very human being, very like us. Fear of changes, fear of going there, fear of this, fear of that, fear of losing something, missing something. But God, again, we see the hero of that story, has prepared everything, has sent Joseph ahead. He thought he had lost Joseph. Uh, you've seen that God will prepare the heart of, of Pharaoh. Hey, come on. He will give to that poor man, uh, not poor man, but old man, the best land of Egypt. That is something you, you cannot comprehend on, unless God would have created that moment. So in Genesis chapter 48, next, 
you will see some things here. When God find Joseph, uh, Jacob find Joseph, he, he said to Joseph, the sovereign God appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. Now he can relate his story. He's an older man. You know he was 130 years old and about at that time when he, when he, so he's an old man. He has, he has uh, his life to look back at, at him. And he said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful in all of this. And then if you continue that text, then he blessed Joseph when he was um, adopting the two sons of Joseph to be part of his family. I take these two will be mine, just like my other sons. Then he blessed Joseph and says, May the God before who my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has protected me from all harm, bless these boys. And, and all of these things. So you've seen the deepening of a relationship. Now he is fully surrender, he fully acknowledge God and to, and to his life. Despite enclosing Joseph's selfish motives, he had a very bad start. God's, the gracious God blessed him. And he, he does the same thing to you and me. Did you have a great start in life? Did you deserve your salvation? Any of us in this room here, we, we are worthy of God's grace. We, we, we earn the right to be loved by God. Is that, is that what the Bible says? Same thing. And God continues to save sinners by grace today. And this is an example. Jacob is a very good example of God, the gracious God, saving by grace the sinners. And he continues to do that today. The Lord refers to himself, God, 22 times in the Bible as the God of Jacob. Can you imagine that? Why does, that, why, why does God still want to be called the God of Jacob? Because he wants us to remember, to re be reminded that he is grace. Because how can a God love a man like Jacob? Only a gracious God can do it. So he wants us to remember the God of the, the, God of the deceiver. The God of the guy with the plan, the God of the bargaining guy, the guy that was so slow to lean upon God, just like us, just like us. God appeared to Jacob seven times in, the, in, in these chapters that we see that. In all of his encounters, God never rebuked him for the, his sins, his failures, but God's grace followed Jacob everywhere he went, just as God promised to him. Amen? Hallelujah. God took an imperfect man, changed him, and used him to fulfill the covenant promise that we have inherited in Jesus Christ, our Savior. L last last uh, uh, verse and closing. And yet, when we come to Hebrew 11, 21, we read of this imperfect man with such a bad start. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old, blessed each of Joseph's son and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. And when you read that last prophetic prayer of blessing that he spoke to all of his descendants upon him, this is like really a giant of faith, a, a man that has an insight into God's heart. He's prophesying the future of the nation. He's telling things that it is impossible. Hallelujah. What matters to you this morning is not how you start. It's how you will finish. Jacob was on a spiritual journey, and it should encourage us this morning, because we are on a very, very similar journey as Jacob. Amen? Hallelujah. Would you